Good evening to everybody. I'm uh, Eloise Reyes and I'm the assembly member representing the 47th Assembly District. This 47th District encompasses the communities of Fontana, Colton, Grand Terrace, Rialto, San Bernardino, and the unincorporated communities of Bloomington and Muscoy. I want to thank all of you for joining us today for this bilingual town hall where we will discuss how we can better equip ourselves to handle natural disasters in our area. We have a Spanish call in line where our translator, Alex Fajardo, the executive director from El Sol Neighborhood Education Center, will be providing a live translation of this town hall. The number for that, actually, I'm going to say it in Spanish because if you're hearing it in English, you are already okay. Si quiere el, el recibir esta información en español, por favor, comuníquese al número 888. 204-5984. Y el código es 1167691. Para poder escuchar todo esto en español. Well, thank you so much once again. And in honor of Emergency Preparedness Month, we wanted to provide you with the information that you need on how our communities can take action and do their part to prevent natural disasters. We've seen how necessary it is for first responders to be fully equipped and ready to respond to emergency situations during these times. My time as an assembly member, I have always made it a priority to bring resources back to our community. In my first year of office, I managed to request and successfully obtain funding through the state budget to award the city of Colton a brand new fire truck and the following year, we did the same thing for the county, for San Bernardino County Fire. Being able to provide two fire trucks to different regions of my district is what ensures that our fire department can adequately respond when the need arises and that they can continue to serve the 47th Assembly District. Well, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest speakers this evening. Joining me today from the San Bernardino County Fire, we have Chief Dan Muncy. Thank you so much for being with us. And I know that you are, uh, you're so busy and we're gonna ask you some more questions about that shortly. And we also have Joanina Gascon, Communications Coordinator from El Sol Neighborhood Education Center to share with you all the great work their offices are doing to ensure the safety and well-being of the community. It's great to have you both with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Before we get started, I also want to set some expectations for this Zoom. During the call, all participants, all my community members who have joined us today will be muted. And we ask that you turn off your video to have only the guest speakers on view. It's not that we don't want to see you, it's just that it's easier to see our special guests here. My team has collected questions from the past several days from the community to ask our panelists. If time permits, we will be answering questions submitted during this town hall at the end. If we're, able to, if we're not able to answer your questions today, my office will gather those questions and make sure we get an answer for you in the next few days. So let's begin. Chief Dan Munsey. I know we're going to be starting this evening uh, with you. Um, Dan Munsey became fire chief of the San Bernardino County Fire Protection District in November 2019. Chief Muncie became began his career in 1995 as a paid call firefighter serving Yucca Valley's community and quickly decided to pursue a career as a full-time firefighter shortly after that. Chief Muncie is one of a few fire chiefs in California who possesses a Center for Public Excellence Fire Chief Officer credential and a California State Fire Marshal Fire Marshal Chief Fire Officer Certificate. Throughout his time, Chief Muncie has enjoyed a diverse career, including executive leadership and management experiences in both the rural and metropolitan fire service communities, including having worked in every division of San Bernardino County Fire. Good evening. Will you please share with us how San Bernardino County Fire has been doing during these trying times? Our community, first of all, wants to thank you from the bottom of our heart to you and all of our first responders for all the work that you're doing. And we'd like to hear from you any general updates you want to share with us. 
Thank you very much. I apologize for not being able to meet you folks in person. I also apologize for not wearing my uniform. I am on the El Dorado fire here in the city of Yucaipa and have been since it started this past Saturday. The California fire service is critically short of all resources right now, including those that can command fires. And throughout my career, I've been blessed to be on incident management teams, uh, national incident management teams. So today I'm, I'm actually working operations section on the incident management team 11, which is a Southern California team made up mostly of, of San Bernardino County firefighters, including the Forest Service, Cal Fire, uh, County of San Bernardino and, and local government. So we're here managing the El Dorado fire, which has been threatening our communities of Yucaipa and Oak Glen. We've mitigated those, those threats, but is currently threatening Forest Falls and Angeles Oaks. Our biggest concern on this fire is that it, it hops Highway 38. Those of you that have driven up Highway 38, it's a beautiful highway. Unfortunately, there's a big scorched area now, and if it jumps 38, it's going to threaten our mountainous communities. So very busy. There's 111 fires of major size going on in California right now, and we just got out of briefing. We're, we're demobbing uh, because we're timing out, meaning that we've served our 14 days here, and we were notified there's no, no teams nationwide that are available. So this is a critical time for the California Fire Service for the nation. We, uh, we haven't been able to order fire engines or aircraft like we normally do. And it's really, uh, to get through this tough time, it's been neighbor helping neighbor. So the County of San Bernardino, we have uh, somewhere upwards to 200 firefighters fighting this fire, which is a large commitment for our fire department. It means that our firefighters aren't going home to their families. They're they're being forced hired, meaning I tell them that the all vacation and days off are canceled. But uh, firefighters sign up for this job. Uh, after this, my commitment on this fire on Saturday, uh, it looks like I'll probably um, get a few days in my office and then may have to do this again in other parts of our county. The Bobcat fire, which is burning in LA County in Monrovia, is continuing to burn north and it's likely a couple days away from Wrightwood, so that's a big threat to us. And in this, this fire here, um, the El Dorado is going to keep burning, although the, the, the fire team that's coming in behind us is full of, of county firefighters too. So a lot going on in the nation and the world. And as a fire department, we're heavily engaged to make sure that we take care of our, our communities. Ma'am, you mentioned that you acquired a brush engine for the County of San Bernardino. We put that in Grand Terrace and it's frontline defense. It's here on this fire. A brush engine is a specialized four wheel drive apparatus that's made for these roads. This is really important because if we can stop the fire in the forest, it's not going to burn into our communities. So we're very grateful for that that assistance that you gave to us. And by the way, the fire chief from Colton who received the other brush engine just arrived on this fire to assume my job here in about a day. So we're, we're working closely together. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. I love the, the teamwork and the partnerships um, it, it's clear to me that our first responders, all of those in fire service, have um, that, that there's this great bond, and I love seeing it. Thank you for, for that update right now. Um, with us also is uh, Joanina Gascon, uh, Promotora from El Sol Neighborhood Education Center. I want to thank you for your collaboration to provide this town hall to our community. El Sol was established in 1991. Um, it's our neighborhood educational center now celebrates 30 years of dedicated service and leadership to the Illinois Empire here in 2021. ESNEC, the acronym, specializes in transforming lives and reimagining communities focusing on neighborhoods that are most under-resourced and marginalized. El Sol is a pioneer in community health worker programs and is a leading agency focused on identifying, training, deploying, and supporting CHWs. They have provided impactful interventions in educating the community about nutrition, mental health, and domestic violence. Within the 30 years, they have improved the lives of more than 200,000 Inland Empire adults and children. You can go ahead and start with your demonstration, if you would, and tell us how we can take the necessary steps to be prepared for a natural disaster. Thank you so much, Assembly Member. I'm gonna go ahead and share a PowerPoint that we have had prepared um, for this occasion. Um, again, my name is, oops, let's 
see if I can get this correct. Can you all see the PowerPoint on the screen? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so my name is Joanie Negascon. I am a communications coordinator and also a community health worker or promotora de salud for El Sol. Uh, so I am one of the uh, what one of the promotoras working on the Listos California campaign. And just to go over a little bit what the Listos California campaign is, um, Gavin Newsom, our governor, set out to reach a, re set out a goal to reach over a million people throughout California. El Sol made the commitment to reach 210,000 people throughout San Bernardino County. That's 20% of the population of the goal that Gavin Newsom set back in August of 2019. Uh, so we want to be able to be sure that people have the information that it's not just those who can afford it or those who know what to do. We want to be able to make sure non-English speakers uh, have access to the information and be as prepared as they possibly can. Uh, so those are the goals of the Lisa's California campaign. And my objective for you today is just to know how you can help yourself, help your family, and help your neighbors, and learn the five most basic steps um, that we have had uh, or the Lisa's California campaign has uh, taken the time to create and, and make sure that everyone has this information. So it's five simple steps and it can be applied to different uh, situations. I know we in California are vulnerable to multiple types of disasters. We have fires, we have floods, and we do have earthquakes. So we want to be able to uh, be prepared for a variety of situations. So why, why learn these five steps? Why worry so much about disaster preparedness? We wanna make sure that we uh, avoid unnecessary fear and stress. We want your family to know what to do. Our kids practice this at school, but do they practice it at home? Especially now in a time where we're not at school every day, it's likely that a, a disaster can happen at home and we need to be able to know what to do at home as well. Um, we also want to have the things that we want to be comfortable. Uh, sometimes being evacuated is an uncomfortable situation. So we want to be able to be able to grab our items from our home and be as comfortable as possible while evacuated. And we also want to help your other people around us. Uh, together we can create great things and do accomplish great things. So we all want to work together and make sure we accomplish this. So here are just some resources that Listos has uh, provided and just it's one of very few resources. What works for me might not work for you, uh, but it's just some good information to have. So we always can rely on our television whenever uh, disasters happen. We can tune into the news. Uh, the radio is probably going to be one of our most reliable sources when we need um, current time updates. We have 211 we can always uh, reach out to. And of course, there's other resources that you can look for uh, that work best to your needs. So our very first step uh, following uh, our, our resources, we want to be able to get alerts and know what to do. Uh, so most of the time, we're not going to know when an earthquake is happening. Some of these resources have claimed that they can give you a notification maybe within 10 seconds between, before an earthquake happens. 10 seconds is not a lot of time to grab your items and, and get out of your home to safety. So these are items that also help you prepare. And if you want to take the further step, we as El Sol um, are providing Listos training. So it's about an hour curriculum and you can get information on how to prepare for different disasters. Or if you want to take a further step, there's CERT in your local city or Listos, which is uh, focused in Sp for the Spanish speakers. Our second step here is to make a plan to protect your people. Uh, the first question I would ask for yourself is who are your people? For me, that's my immediate family, my mom, my dad, my brother, my sister, and of course my two pets. They're people too. So I want to be able to have this plan to be sure that they are ready to go. So um, we have already established a plan within my family. Since I'm the one who works closest to home, I will go home and retrieve the two dogs. Um, my uh, sister and brother-in-law live far away from each other, so or live far away from us. So we are going to try and find a midpoint is where we can meet to catch up. So um, always have a plan and always know that your plan is not exactly going to go perfect, perfect, but it does eliminate an amount of stress when you do have a plan and you know what to do. 
oh, so-and-so is going to take care of this and I'm going to take care of this. It'll all get done together. And then another important thing we want to remind is to teach your children. If they are school age or they can mimic what you do, they can understand what is going on. So we want to be sure that you know, your children know what to do in the case of a disaster. Do they know your uh, cell phone number or do they know the home phone number? Making sure they know how to get in contact with you if for whatever reason they're separate from you. How to dial 911 and when to dial 911. Um, that's an important thing to remember because 911 is highly utilized in events of emergencies um, and we want to be sure that it's being used correctly. Uh, we also want to establish family meetup locations because we as a family aren't always together. So we want to be able to establish where we can find each other and how to reach out of town contacts. Perhaps when a, an emergency happens, the cell phone isn't really, the call isn't really going through. So maybe you've established a contact for, for someone out of the area to say, to call them and say, hey, I'm okay. Can you please let anyone else who comes in and check? Say, uh, let them know I'm okay. So that is another alternate to um, catching up everyone to speed. And then other things you should keep in mind, everyone's circumstance is different. Uh, some of us may be uh, pregnant and there is some arrangements that you have to make. Uh, we have elderly family members. Some of us might take, a, um, mom, take care of mom and dad. They might have Alzheimer's or they just might uh, be physically disabled. So we want to be sure that we understand our situation and make a plan for each, um, each situation. So uh, the next thing I wanna go into is uh, an emergency kit. So this is the uh, part of our plan. Uh, we have different types of kits and different type of, types of kits work for each person. And I'm also going to go ahead and share a little bit of what I have in my kit, just so you guys can all see as an example. Um, so we have kits for children, we have kits for seniors, we have kits for pets. Um, it just depends on what your situation is. So I'm gonna go ahead and share. So I have here my backpack. Um, it looks pretty heavy. It's actually not that heavy. I tried to pick items that weren't as heavy um, to be able to pack it. And it's just a few simple items um, of what I thought was necessary. Uh, so the first thing that I have uh, packed in the side pocket here is, if I can get it out, is my charger. I don't know if you can see that there. Uh, so we as human beings now can't seem to survive without our cell phones. Um, and in the event that you have to take off really quickly, and you just grab your phone. I know I have my charger for later on because after communicating with so many people, that phone is gonna be dead. Uh, so make sure you always have your charger. Um, in the smaller side pockets here, I have, I have some gloves in case we have to go through any debris, anything, um, Anything that I have to maybe dig for something, it's here. I have some gloves. I have emergency blankets. We never know when a disaster might happen, so we might be in uncomfortable situations or it might be cold or might want to be covering from the rain. I also have a poncho. And an N95 mask for the fires if we were ever to be in, in an area with fires. On this other side pocket here, have a whistle in the event that I need to grab anyone's attention. I have a bag of spare batteries because I have a few flashlights that you'll be seeing shortly and also a radio. I have a second charger because you never know if it'll malfunction. And then in the larger pockets I have a box of granola bars. Uh, my mother happens to be diabetic, so I always want to make sure she has some type of food with her. Uh, so we carry that. I have pouches of tuna. Um, I went with the pouches because I thought it'd be lighter than the cans, and I don't think anyone wants to be running around with cans in their backpack. <laughs> um, and then the last portion in this, I have 
Um, I personally don't have any medical conditions, but I call this my pharmacy bag. It's just allergy pills. Um, I do, I'm, I have a, a few ibuprofen in there in case of a migraine, you know, these can be stressful situations that might result in a headache. So that's what I have in that bag, in that pocket. I have some crackers for the pouches of tuna. My alarm clock radio that can be battery operated. Um, I know that in the event of a drastic emergency, perhaps TV won't be available or internet. Um, so I know the radio will be the most reliable source to get updates. Um, spare change of clothes, comfy clothes that you know uh, you can be on the go with because you never know when you're going to be leaving your home or how quickly. Some spare shoes and an extra pair of socks. Like I said, you never know, it could be raining. And I personally don't like wet socks. <laughs> then I also have a uh, first aid, first aid kit. Uh, this was a uh, most of these items I've either collected from health fairs or from different trainings. So it's nice when you attend health fairs and different uh, trainings because then you can get to collect your items to build your kits. So this was a, a from uh, the Listos training, and this uh, I thought was pretty handy because it's a fully loaded uh, first aid kit for basic first aid. Obviously, I'm going to leave the the, uh, the bigger stuff to the professionals. I have two flashlights. And lastly, I have cash in small quantities just because we never know uh, when, uh, let's say there's no electricity for a long time you're not going to be able to use your credit card or your debit card. Uh, so we want to have that cash. And in small quantities, because let's say the stores run out of change. I know right now we currently have a shortage of coins. Um, so we want to keep those quantities as small as possible because in the event of emergency, I'm sure you're gonna pay whatever it takes to get a case of water if that's what you need. And the last items that I have here is uh, a document holder for my important items. I have my, a copy of my passport, social security, driver's license, all put away safely. It's waterproof, uh, just in case you never know what if you take off without your wallet and have no form of identification. And then you need to go get your kids from school, which they're going to ask for identification to get your kids from school. So that's the one thing that I have. And then the last thing is the disaster guide. It's all filled out with my emergency contacts and any extra uh, things that I need to grab before I take off from home. Um, so we have these disaster guides available at the El Sol office. If anyone's interested, you're always welcome to reach out to us and I will share that information later. Um, so that's just a basic uh, emergency preparedness bag or to-go bag. Uh, we recommend based off of uh, experience and different uh, trial and error that each family member have their own bag. And like I said, each uh, who you consider your family member is different um, from person to person. So I said I include my pets, so I do have some food packed aside for them. So that is the third step that I, I mentioned. Remember, what works for me might not work for you, so each person's bag is going to look a little bit different, but these are just basic items. And then we also want to know what our evacuation routes are. Um, I personally, I live in Ontario, so if the 15 goes down and I need to go north, I need to figure out another alternate besides the 15. So um, those are just some things to take into consideration. Um, like I mentioned, there's other items you can include. You can have a key ring, um, any, any other items you may find essential. Uh, these are just some examples of what is shown in the Listos guide, the disaster preparedness guide that I had shown you. Um, so some people might wanna carry their laptop because they can receive alerts from there or um, a map, um, extra cash, and different, uh, diff like a list of medications. Let's say you take off without your medications, uh, you can be able to identify what you need when you do get to where you need to be. Our fourth step is the stay, uh, the stay box. So this is for when you can't leave home. Uh, this should have some food, some water, 
uh, different items just to make sure you don't starve when you can't leave your home. Um, I know in the beginning of this pandemic, a lot of us ran and panic to the grocery stores. We want to do our best to avoid that and, and, and have a little bit set aside each time. It doesn't mean you need to go out and spend $150 right now just to put your box ready. When you go to the store, I'm going to buy an extra case of water, set it aside, and little by little build up your stay box. Um, these are just more examples. Um, we have trash bags and a plastic bucket set aside. You know, um, bodily functions don't stop in, in, in a disaster. So these are just different options of what you have to be able to get creative to do what you have to do. And our last uh, step of our five steps, we want to remind you to help your friends, help your neighbors, because as a community, we can do so much more. Um, so there's just different options and how you can prepare, help your neighbors and help your friends, you know, take this information that you heard today and go share them like, hey, I was in a presentation and they were talking about making a stay box to make it little by little. Make sure you go and share that. This is not a secret to be kept. Then you can also volunteer. You can also go through trainings like Sir or Listos and get more information, get more informed. Knowledge is power. Some last reminders, um, you always wanna make sure you carry some kind of identification. Build a support network. We can't do things on our own, or we can do things on our own, but it's so much easier when you have someone with you. And um, nobody's a mind reader, so when you need help, ask for help. Um, we also talk about try and reduce stress. We want to make the situation the least stressful as possible. Sometimes that's easier said than done, especially when you have to evacuate from your home, but take those extra steps so you can prevent this from happening in the future. And that is what I have for my presentation. I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to listen. Uh, we have plenty of great information on all of our uh, Facebook page or Instagram or social media networks. So if you wanna reach out to us, you're more than welcome to at elsolnec.org or our um, social media is just exactly the same, elsolnec. And I believe that is all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Janina. I, I, I think I would like to uh, find out when you're going to be auctioning off that backpack, because I want to bid on it. I don't want to have to <laughs> Chief, what do you think of the backpack that, uh, that we just uh, saw? You know what, there's a couple of points there. Neighbor helping neighbor, community helping community. That is so important to me as the fire chief, because we're better together. Uh, the second point is I'm thinking about Forest Falls and Angeles Oaks communities right now that are both have fire right in those communities. And our firefighters are doing a great job protecting those houses, but there's a lot of people that weren't prepared. And to have a plan like that was just shared, and that was a very robust plan, very detailed, is so important. And I think people take that for granted. And they also take for granted that you're gonna be out of your house maybe a day or two, but in Forest Falls case tonight, they've been, they've been out a week. And potentially the fire could be in that canyon for another week or two. And I, I think that we're gonna let them in a little bit sooner than that, but being prepared to immediately go and grab your go bag, whether it's your office or by your bed or out of your house and taking those items with you, that truly is gonna protect your family is incredibly important. So great presentation, very good. Thank you. Well, we did receive some community questions and Chief, let me start with you. Uh, here's the first question. What are the greatest risks in our region in regards to natural disasters? Well, Wildland fire is definitely a problem. And we have high hazard areas, especially in our San Bernardino mountain areas. And people take for granted that there's, they don't live in the forest, their house is gonna be okay, but that's just not true anymore with the fire weather. Fire fronts come in and they burn house after house after house, they're very difficult to stop. We are, we're using bigger and bigger jets. You guys see the 747s dropping on, on these fires. Those jets weren't even available when I first started and we're still having trouble stopping. Then I think, I'll go back to Forest Falls and Angel Soaks, both of them. Now that the hillsides have burned, those communities are gonna be under great threat from flooding 
and mudslides. And that those happens in our local hillsides and we've seen it all the way from Santa Barbara along the coast and we've seen it locally where hillsides give away and, and mud debris occur. Earthquakes. This is Southern California and we've been blessed not to have a major earthquake in a few years. Matter of fact, many of our residents that have, local, that have moved to the state in the last 10 years, they don't understand the danger that we have in our county, especially with San Andreas. Follow a plan, please have an emergency plan like the one that was just presented to you and understand that your local public response, your, your public safety, your first responders, we may be so busy saving people that we may not be able to meet your basic needs. You're, you need to ensure that you have water and batteries and flashlights and food for your family. So those are some of the variety of, of disasters that we have in our county and in, in Southern California. So please be safe and please understand that while we haven't had an earthquake in a while, it, it will occur. And, and don't assume because you live out of, a, out of the forest that your house is safe from fire. That is just not true and be prepared for the flooding that we see once in a while in our county. I know with my colleague in Santa Barbara, after the fires last year, the greatest loss was from the floods that came after. Um, I, so I absolutely agree with you on that. Uh, now there was lots, jo Jonina shared lots about preparing. Is there anything um, extra, anything additional that you'd like to share about other steps that we should take to prepare for these natural disasters? Yes, yeah, so I think all of us have a responsibility as, as community members to make sure that we're trying to actively mitigate um, and reduce the risk and protect ourselves before we just call 911. So the fire service has done a great job with fire prevention week now it's fire prevention month. We really reduce the fire deaths in the United States. And we, we do things like encouraging people to check smoke detectors. Let me, let me, just one little quick fact. I've been on lots of fires. In, I've been on a lots of fatality fires in houses and they all had one common thing. They didn't have working smoke detectors. Make sure your smoke detectors are working because that will save you and your family's lives. The other, Thing I'll often talk about is the County of San Bernardino is one of the busiest fire departments in the United States. We respond to 150,000 calls a year. And I'm not proud of that because those are 150,000 calls that I should have done something different to prevent. We need to prevent disasters from occurring. We need to prevent fires from occurring. We need to prevent people from dying of heart attacks. That's my job and I need the community support. We call that community risk reduction. Everybody every homeowner, every citizen, every resident should do a hazard analysis. What are the hazards around my neighborhood? Help your elderly neighbors, help those that, that are disabled with clearing the weeds around their yards and helping them trim their trees, um, helping them if it looks like it's gonna flood, putting sandbags, but try to prevent the damage before it occurs. So that's the one piece that I'd really like our communities to focus on is that community risk reduction, those risks that are facing us, let's get rid of them before we have to call 911. Let's get rid of them before we have to use the emergency of plans that, that was just demonstrated to us. I really like the phrase uh, community risk reductions uh, because it talks about how we need to work with each other, we need to partner with each other and help That's each right. other. Yeah. That's That's right. very good. Now here's another question for you, Chief. It says, what are the department's three main focuses when it comes to community safety? Well, so it's a hazard analysis and then studying all the different hazards that our communities present. And we literally do that. We'll look at every single community, whether it's Grand Terrace or, or Colton or, or San Bernardino, and we determine what are the probabilities and the risk of an incident occurring? What's the probability of an earthquake? And if there was an earthquake, what is the risk? How high is it? A severe risk, low risk, medium risk? And then we start thinking about the mitigations. So that's a hazard analysis. The mitigation is the, the risk reduction, those things that we can take before the incident occurs, whether it's education, there's, there's five of them that we look at. We look at education, go out and educate the public uh, on emergency escape plans and how to prepare you and your family for an emergency, how to, how to pack for an emergency, uh, gathering the family at a location, a safe location, so we educate. The second is 
we have to enforce the policies and rules that we have. We need to make sure that we have safe communities. So we'll enforce those, those rules. For instance, we have our fire prevention officers that visit businesses and they make sure that they're compliant with local fire codes. The third is economic incentives. And we need to encourage people to do the right thing. And when people do the right thing, we need to recognize them, celebrate them. Um, but if somebody's doing the wrong thing, sometimes we need to, to send them maybe um, a bill for the things that they do wrong. For instance, our fire inspectors will go out and they'll look at properties in the high hazard area. And if properties aren't meeting the fire code, then they'll send them an invoice that basically says, you need to clean up these weeds around your house because they're a danger to your neighborhood. And if you don't, then we'll send uh, a fire crew to clean it up and we'll bill you for that. So there's these things that we can do to support removing the risk from our community. So identifying the hazards and then working hard to prevent those from occurring. And the third is that response is to make sure that your fire department is all risk, meaning we do so much more than just fighting fires. We are prepared. We have, we have one of the few uh, USAR teams in California, one of 12 of them, matter of fact, what we call regional task force that are trained in urban search and rescue. If your house collapses on you in an earthquake, our guys are trained to a very high specialty. During the mudslides in Montecito, our guys were there digging through the muds. During the Paradise Fire, after all those houses burned down and they were missing people, our guys were there doing the search and rescue. So having a fire department that's, that is all risk and it's not just fire, but that really truly is, is well-educated and well-experienced is really important. I remember now that you mentioned the Paradise Fire, I remember going with a number of my colleagues uh, the devastation afterwards. It, it looked like a war zone, something that I never would have imagined until we took that bus up there and met with some of the community members. Um, I don't want that to ever happen to any anyone in our community. Uh, but here's, I'm working hard, to, working hard to prevent that. Thank you. Yes. And here's the, the last question that is for you, Chief. It says, for those, whenever there is a natural disaster, uh, it, there are some who are impacted, some who are not impacted. For those who are not impacted by that natural disaster, what can they do to help? Well, I tell you what, people are at their best when there's a disaster occurring and everybody wants to help. You need to be prepared for the disaster to help. And there's the COAD and the BOAD groups that are out there that are volunteer organizations that um, gather up citizen groups to help in emergencies. Uh, join one of those. The CERT team, which is the, the community emergency uh, response teams, are another great organization for folks to, to join and receive training. Um, the third is to, to support your neighbors. Uh, as, as emergencies occurs, our fire resources, our EMS resources are going to be stretched thin. And if you can lend a hand to your neighbor and bail them out, maybe let them stay in your house or, or support them with food or water that you might have, or even just going to their property and digging away mud if it was a mudslide or something like that. Those are important things, but try to do so safely. Be prepared yourself so you're not part of the problem is another thing. We often have citizens that wait until the emergency and then they want to help, but the problem is they're not trained. So go out and receive the training through the BOADs and the COADs and the, the CERT teams through the RACES, which is our amateur radio, radio association, the ham operators that help us emergency. Go learn CPR, go join the Red Cross, a great organization to receive training and be part of an organizational group because we can deploy groups a lot better. They're gonna come in supported, they're gonna come with a plan, they're gonna come with trained rescuers and they're gonna be part of the solution. Uh, the CPR training is extremely important. I know that my, my entire staff uh, wanted to go through the training and good. we did it through Rialto Fire Department. Very they good. Were they uh, gave us tests afterwards and everybody passed. So we were very pleased about that. Thank you so much, Chief. Oh, you're quite welcome. Uh, questions for Joanina. Uh, it says two of your main focus, two of your main focuses are health and education. Can you please explain why it is necessary to promote these educational materials in our region and how individuals can also spread the word? Okay, so, uh, from my understanding, I've lived in this region my entire life, and we have one of the most diverse 
uh, populations that could could possibly be. And I think uh, what we do as an organization to spread information is all for prevention. And uh, Chief Muncy mentioned it himself as well. Prevention is key. Uh, we need to make sure that this information is available before because once it happens, it's too late. Uh, so we want to be able sh the, to be sure that everyone has the information necessary to be able to live a higher quality of life with this information. Very good. And for another question for you, jo Jonina, is for an individual who has a disability or a special need, what additional steps should they take to protect themselves and their household in an emergency? Uh, so as I mentioned before, it's to make a plan to protect your people, to protect yourself. So if you happen to have a disability, know who are you going to communicate with in the event of a disaster or um, make sure that there is clear understanding of what needs to be done when a disaster happens. You know, we talk so much about uh, the earthquake drill and a lot of people tell me, oh, I have a bad knee. I can't get down on the ground. Well, then um, the importance is that you go ahead and make sure that your head is protected and your neck is covered. Um, that you can sit down in a chair and cover yourself with a pillow or you can uh, put your hands over your neck and bend over. That's It's simple steps that we need to be able to make sure that people know they can do without ha harming themselves. Thank you so much. I um, Here's a, a, a question that I think would be appropriate for both of you. It says, what is your organization doing to ensure information is getting out to the community? So we, uh, we do a variety of things. Uh, we're very active on social media. That's very important to me that we have a social media presence because frankly, that's how people receive their news now. Uh, it's, um, we have a great PIO team that's constantly making videos and doing things like TikTok, which I never thought we could do, and, and YouTube, and uh, Periscope, and Facebook, and Twitter, and things like that. In addition, we're regularly commuting, communicating to groups uh, of citizens, just like we are doing right now, and attending council meetings and, and attending citizen groups. We're very regularly attending we'll go, we'll visit those. And those of you that are part of neighborhood associations, thank you, they're great. And if you're not, look up, see if you have a neighborhood association in your area. Uh, we enjoy it when people write us letters or when they call us on the phone. We like to communicate, make sure that we're providing good communication with them. Now, with all that said, we're also working on some more innovative technologies and creating dashboards for our citizens to use on our website where they can visit our website and they can receive real-time information, not only the incidents that we're responding to, but be able to look at our budget and where are we spending our money be able to ask us questions and have two-way dialogue, but really in an effort to create transparency and, and better communication with those that are, we serve. If you need any more information on emergency preparedness, please do visit our website at sbcfire.org. That's SBC is in San Bernardino County, fire.org. Thank you so much. It's, it's clear that there's so much we can do for the disaster strikes. Um, and then once it is here, as Joanina uh, shared in, in her presentation, then you have to know what your plan is. Uh, we, we always hope that these things don't happen to us, but if they do, we have to know what our plan is. We have to know who we're going to get together with, what we're going to do, what's going to be in our backpack um, and, and our safety, what was it called, a safety box or a home box? Oh, what was the word, Joanina? A stay box. A stay box, because sometimes you do have to stay at home. Well, I, I really appreciate all of these comments. I do want to um, pro uh, provide some time for some some closing remarks. Uh, Joanina, why don't you tell us, you know, what do you expect from from those who are listening? And I can tell you that we have people from. Uh, I was looking at the list from the entire community that um, is that is listening in. And I think most of us, we're all the same. We, we know we should be prepared and we just haven't taken the time to be prepared. I appreciate that somebody has put the, the list on the chat box so that if somebody wants to look at the list, they can see what it is they need to put in their backpack and in their stay box. 
Um, any any final thoughts uh, from you? Well, I hope that everyone takes this information and they go and share it with their family, their kids, their moms, their dads, their, their friends, their neighbors, really. Um, this information is not to be kept secret. It's most important that we all get ready to go. Um, we know that our, our firefighters at the moment are being spread thin. So if we can do anything to help the situation, we should do it. Thank you. Now, if, if somebody wants to contact um, Lisa, now, wait, before you continue, I do want to show, I do have my, my mask, listos. Um, I, one of my colleagues, Senator, uh, one of my Senator friends had hers on and I thought, well, wait a minute, I didn't get mine. So Janina, I appreciate that I, that I did get mine so that I can use it and remind people that we do have to be listos. And uh, for those who don't speak Spanish, what does listos mean? It means ready. That's right. To be listos, to be ready. So listos means all of us will be, will be ready. Uh, Chief Muncie, how about some closing remarks from you? you know, I wanna thank you again. You've been such a strong supporter for public safety, for this fire department, for the men and women, and for me. That support means everything to us. And the firefighters are tired right now. This has been a very hard fire season. We almost joke around every year and we say, hey, it's gonna be the 38th worth, worst fire season ever. And the next year we'll say it's going to be the 39th worst fire season ever. This is the worst fire season that I've faced in my career. And when we see a sign on a highway next to a fire and it just says, thank you, firefighters, it means everything to us. Um, when, when you are involved in emergencies, when I, it, I'll mention this. We have a lot of public that when we advise them, it's time to evacuate. They don't want to go. They want to stay and protect their houses. And it, and it really puts our firefighters at risk is now they have to shift their attention from fighting the fire to save the public. Please listen to evacuation orders if you, if you see those. Um, please, it means a lot to me when you smile and wave at our, at our firefighters and say thank you. That makes them feel great and it makes it worth being away from their families. So please doing that. I love working in our San Bernardino communities. This is my home and it, uh, it's very important to me. I would like to come back and do another presentation though and talk a little bit more about our fire department and talk in depth about some of the conversations you and I have had regarding uh, some of our firefighter programs and how we're creating community connections and how we're really trying to hire firefighters from our local community, how we're giving people second chances in lives. I'd really like to talk about some of our specialty resources from wildland hand crews to some of our, our helicopters and uh, heavy equipment some of our specialty fire engines. So given an opportunity, I'd really like to come back and, and talk to you folks again. Well, rest assured, we will make that happen. Uh, as you know, my AB 2147 was signed by the governor just a few days ago. So I sincerely appreciate when you talk about second chances. Uh, after somebody has received that training uh, to be able to get a second chance, um, once, once they are, are, have, have paid their debt to society and completed their sentence. So that uh, is a very meaningful um, bill for me and for so many others. And I appreciate your, your, the work that you have done in this regard. Um, I sincerely appreciate that. Thank you so very much. And we will, we'll figure out some way to, to get it, to get you back to do another program. I think my nephew who was also a firefighter, Moises, I think he would sincerely appreciate it. And who knows, maybe we'll get him on the program, a little bit of uh, nepotism here, um, who knows. Um, I, I promise you I'll have a haircut by then. This, uh, not only COVID, but this is, since the apple fire, it's been nonstop. And I'll wear my uniform next time, so I look a little bit, and I might even shave. So. Uh, I, I think I, I, everybody on this call, Ronina and everybody else on this call would agree that it doesn't matter what uniform, whether you have your uniform or, or not, uh, what matters is that um, that you are here with us and that you're sharing with us and that you that you will also send the message to the rest of the first responders, all of those that work with you. Uh, it's, it's a grateful, grateful community here um, who wants to say thank you. Well, we've come to the end and I want to not only thank the two of you, th this has been wonderful. Uh, I've learned a lot and uh, Janina, I wasn't kidding. I want to know when you're going to auction off that um, backpack. <laughs> I want to bid on it. Um, 
I know that here in my office, I have a really wonderful team from my district director, Maha Rizvi, to my senior uh, field representative, Esmeralda Vasquez, also my communications director, uh, Daniel Peden, also with us today, who has been handling this entire town hall, is Daisy Artiaga, field representative, uh, also Prince Ogadikte, another field representative, and of course our scheduler, who makes sure the calendar is right on schedule, and that is Lucy Prion. I have the most wonderful team, and so for any of you who are listening to this program, please know we are here to help. We're here to provide any resources that you feel the community needs. If you have a question regarding EDD, if you have a question regarding DMV or any other state office, please reach out to us. It's clear from listening to what we've heard today that the best way to do, to, the best way to prepare is by providing useful information for you and for your family and to listen to your concerns and to let you know that when, when it's time to, to, to move forward in times of a natural disaster, we need to be prepared. And as has been said by both of our uh, great um, guests, we also need to be good neighbors. Um, when something happens to a neighbor, it's really happening to us. We're, we're all one big family. I want to encourage you to check our website for upcoming town halls, but also check out the website for uh, San Bernardino County Fire and also for Listos, El Sol. I want to thank all of you who provided questions. And just before I leave, I see a note from LaShawn Jackson. Um, uh, it's hard, uh, we can't go through all of the chat, but I just happened to see that one. She says, uh, I was trapped in a fire as a teenager, and if it wasn't for the help of the firefighters, I wouldn't be here today. Uh, so thank you for all you do. Um, LaShawn, thank you so much for sharing that. And for all the rest of you, thank you for being with us. Uh, I wish you great happiness, and I wish you some safety. Be prepared and call El Sol so that you can get that backpack. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye.